Uh, we shall now, I think Dr. Ashish, you are ready. So we can take your talk and uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ashish Nagpal, who's the medical director and the chief eye surgeon at Nagpal Center for Cornea, uh, Ahmedabad. And he's going to take us on to a very quintessential topic, principles of corneal wound suturing. So you're on to you, Dr. Ashish. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you for including me in this uh, very lovely session with such robust speakers and teachers, my own teachers here. Uh, I hope I'm audible. And yes, can yes. you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I've, in the next eight minutes, I'll just cover the basic principles of uh, corneal wound suturing. I think they come in all varieties and all types and all depths. But just to highlight uh, what we need is just a basic idea of what are we trying to achieve. We all know that we've already covered glaucoma. Uh, we just want to restore the anatomy and the function and prevent other complications. So how do we go about doing it? So I've divided it into three parts as what to do before surgery, during and after. Before and after, I'll be limiting to just a few busy slides just to cover all the points. But an important point here is that uh, one should spend time to understand the nature of the injury, try and talk to the patient's relatives to understand because sometimes there may be projectiles which may not be understood, especially with children. And second is do not use any topical drops uh, because the eye is open and we may impact the internal structures and never forcefully examine. I would say we should always try and examine under controlled conditions. And of course, we can do all the tests, the CT scan, B scan, but I'll move over to the uh, other important aspects is because normally the issue is also about when to do the surgery right away. Sometimes it's not possible. So just a few tips that we should have a patch, but uh, best with the occluder with something so that it covers the globe. It does not put any pressure on the eye because if the structures may come outside, uh, another important thing is to give an analgesic and anti-emetic uh, so that there is least amount of pressure because in such sort of injuries, the patients may also be pretty traumatized and there may be a lot of anxiety and other aspects. And of course, tetanus, of course, can be covered as well. Avoid pressure patch is the message. And the most important thing is usually in these cases, you know, I find that the pre-surgery when the patient is under anesthesia, when you're taking the patient for surgery is when you should spend time to try and understand because a slit lamp examination sometimes is not possible in these situations. So one should spend time just before the surgery, before you scrub to have a look, understand uh, the kind of injury and what all it will require. And during surgery, so once you are taking the patient, once you're ready, I think the most important thing I feel is uh, to make sure that you have the right kind of speculum or you can use lid sutures because we do not want any pressure at all on the globe. And the second part is that we should totally avoid, uh, not totally avoid because sometimes it's very difficult to put an opsite and you may actually, there may be some adnexal injury which you may like to treat and it's very difficult to do that. So. A lot of times we should, we can do away without this or maybe a modified offsite without the adhesive. And as you start, the first thing is after you have examined, you need to do a thorough wash of the wound margin as atraumatically as possible, clear all the debris, look for any foreign bodies, making sure that you do not uh, introduce any foreign body inside, which may be and be very gentle, try and avoid pulling on any structures or because sometimes it is Nature tries to heal it very well with the iris and fibrinous membrane. It's very difficult to uh, differentiate. So try and use uh, BSS and Visco as much as possible to differentiate between the two. And once you've established how big is the corneal tear, how big is the wound, then you can introduce, you can uh, definitely use a side port because that is the best way. Do not try and introduce viscoelastic or BSS or air from the main wound uh, per se. Although there may be, having said that, there may be times when there is no other option because it's a very soft tie. But you have to try and balance these situations. 
And of course, just to note here that whenever you finished with the surgery, you always suture up the side port as well. So what are the types of wound? This is just to cover broadly that you may have wounds which are perpendicular, they may be shelved, they may be uh, areas which uh, may be involving the limbus. And sometimes you also get an idea uh, whether the person will need a vitrectomy or a lens management as well. So these are the broad types of the wounds. So how do we go about treating them? I will be briefly covering it in the next five minutes. So before we start suturing them, uh, I think the important thing is to keep in mind the type of needle and the type of suture. Most commonly, we'll be using uh, Tenno nylon. And I personally prefer to use the CS Ultima needle because it's very sharp. And it, although the Orolab needle is also pretty good, uh, there's no financial interest here. But these are the two needles which I would prefer for uh, any corneal trauma. The reason is because in these situations, we also would like to use a no-touch technique wherever possible uh, so that you do not have to lift up the edge of the wound and you need a very sharp and spatulated uh, needle which can pass through easily. Moreover, uh, with this particular needle, it also helps because it becomes like a triangular spatulated entry. It eases in the uh, burial of the knot as well, which I'll be discussing towards the end of my talk. So uh, I think there is no compromise to the quality of instruments. Just a note that we would need a non-locking needle holder in these situations, because sometimes if it gets locked, uh, sometimes you may pull on the tissue. So it's always recommended to use a non-locking needle holder. And of course, you can use forceps. You should have both trauma atraumatic forceps and tooth forceps, depending on the uh, so that you can use them accordingly. So this is just a mnemonic to remember, just to remember the principles that what are we trying to achieve? We need very good opposition because the cornea is not a very elastic tissue like skin. So we need to have a good opposition on table uh, and it has to be good enough that we, we do not make it too tight or too loose. The length, the general recommendation is it should be equidistant from the posterior margin. Uh, why I'll be discussing in the next slide because sometimes the wounds may not be very perpendicular. So I'll dis I'll describe why the why we should look at the posterior margin, and the tension also needs to be appropriate because of the curvature of the cornea. So the recommendation is to have a little tighter tension, especially when the cornea is edematous, because sometimes it may become loose later on. Uh, and of course, it should be tighter in the periphery versus the center. The radiality, the basic principle is to be perpendicular to the tear as we know. So this is an ideal dimension of a suture that it should be of this much 1.5 length. It should be at least 90% for any corneal suturing and equal on both sides and perpendicular to the wound. But this is also for mainly surgical wounds. But in a tear, you may have a variety of uh, suturing. Like in this case, this fortunately was a lamellar tear. It was not a full thickness tear. So in this case, you can get away with a 70 to 80 percent thickness. You do not actually need to go so deep. So why I was describing the posterior edge, why it should be equidistant to the posterior edge is because some, most of these cases, a lot of them will have a shell wound. And if you try to make it equidistant to the anterior, you can see in the slide below, that it will be inappropriate traction and it will, the posterior edge will be gaping over there and it will lead to inappropriate tissue apposition, which you can see. This is an OCT of one of our patients uh, before surgery. As you can see, the posterior edge is unopposed. So we had to resuture it and then we opposed it again. And that's how, so this is just to dis show you that this is how well opposed the tissue should be. And that's why we need to keep the posterior edge. Sometimes it's not visible. So sometimes you have to estimate it. But this is the basic principle that you should oppose it to the posterior edge. So this is the same picture as you can see over here. Coming to the entry angle, I think this is an important thing to remember that uh, suppose how you are entering the needle. So if it is at an acute angle, sometimes you will end up with a very shallow suture 
if you are doing a very obtuse angle. So you need to keep this in mind. The idea is to go perpendicular to the cornea. So you may have to shift your needle holder and hand accordingly. Sometimes you may, if it's difficult, you can shift your microscope also into different positions and take it. You do not need to sit superiorly or temporarily, depending on your comfort. So this is just to highlight that what happens if you have a shallow suture, you will have inappropriate as already seen. Unequal depth will lead to an overriding of the tissue. Full thickness suture, you may end up, you know, there's a risk of microbial invasion and contamination. So as always, we avoid full thickness sutures in most surgeries in cornea. So the sequence of suturing is something which everybody has to figure out after looking at the particular. So this is a small animation uh, made by my colleague, Dr. Yatri Pandya, in which you can see. So, so you identify the apex. So first suture the apex, and then you can suture the ends, and then titrate and suture accordingly. Take more sutures based on the uh, length of the tear. If you have a limbal incision, limbal tear, you can go from there. If you have a odd, sometimes you may need to start from uh, the other end. And sometimes you may need to take a temporary suture if, because if it's collapsing, you can take a suture at the apex and take a broad suture and then try and put some visco and start again. But these are just general guidelines. You will have to figure it out as you go. And why it is important to, about the number of sutures, I think I'll quickly go through these principles. Uh, these are a busy slides, but I think these are there in most textbooks uh, and YouTube as well. So you can go through them, but it's very important why the length of the suture, why each suture would be important because you have to understand the zone of compression. And so accordingly, one needs to titrate and take more number of sutures. So this particular slide is to highlight what we should not do, because in this case, there are less sutures and you can see there is more scarring and a lot of overriding. So one has to take more sutures in this kind of a situation. So that needs to be titrated and one needs to understand the zone of compression and accordingly take. And most important, I think, is I see a lot of sutures which, when we the knots are not buried and it undoes a very good surgery as well. So I think it's very important to bury the knot, rotate it and try and place it away from the visual axis is the recommendation. And once you have rotated it, just pull it back again so that it's easier to remove because the V-shape of the knot goes towards the apex of the cornea. These are just techniques which are recommended uh, since many years that the basic principles of that you should take tighter sutures and longer sutures in the periphery with the idea that you maintain the contour of the cornea. But sometimes, depending on the tissue loss, uh, one may need to modify. Uh, so the globe integrity is more important, but if you have a clean tear, a clean knife, then these principles will work very well. I will not go into the details of the topographic considerations. I've just kept them here in case somebody needs to refer to them in the slide. And this concludes what are the principles. I think towards the end, uh, what to do, uh, I have just covered the systemic antibiotics, topical steroids. And of course, one would need suture removal and follow-up management, either for the cataract. Sometimes patients may end up with trichmes or endophthalmitis. I think Dr. Shushmita probably will be covering that part. And with this, I conclude my talk with these principles. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, basic uh, principle what you explained, Dr. Ashis was very, very, very well explained. My question to you is how would you manage the triradiate uh, wound which is which has got no linear cuts? So what should we keep in our mind? Because most of the patient, we don't get that even V-cut linear wound. They may have just a stone and stone injury and you'll have a triradiate or four radiate. Uh, wound and uh, any other uh, surgical uh, principle or surgical modalities you are using, Dr. Purendran, when you are do, uh, doing corneal tear repair? I think um, um, Dr. Ashish has covered very nicely and highlighted the important aspects. And uh, in eight minutes' time, I think he has covered most of the things. 
and um, he has highlighted few things which uh, are often uh, neglected like so what we have to do before the surgery and i think that points uh, those all those points are very very useful and um, as you have said the tri radiate tear um, mm -hmm. what we do is uh, in such cases we uh, go for uh, uh, all the uh, the branches of the tri radiate tear we repair and then in the middle we put up a string suture and uh, if needed we can use a glue and uh, do the glue vcl also at the end and all these cases for better opposition and uh, no leak things but uh, all these cases are really it depends on many things like the extent of tear the size of tear how much uh, uh, teethering is there how many pieces of uh, the corneal um, uh, this thing are there because these wounds are very very lacerated wounds and are very 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 uh, uh, this thing uh, 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 patient specific and uh, they, uh, all the strategies have to be developed on table during the during this thing so what uh, uh, another thing uh, i would like to say is that uh, our uh, ultimate goal is to have a uh, i mean water tight wound uh, it should not uh, leak uh, from anywhere so blue bcl is uh, at the end should be um, it, it helps a lot and very little amount of glue if it is required then we can place and form the chamber with air i see network had gone so just a question i missed out some of the discussions here yeah uh, what would be your timing of suture removal if you have done your sutures based on between uh, uh, dr maskati would you want to take this yeah it depends on the age of the uh, patient the younger the child if you have uh, first of all you when you're doing a repair in a child you need to tell the parents about multiple ga that they will require multiple ga because Um, a child will heal even about 10 days or 15 days time sometimes in very young children you can remove the sutures when it is healed generally speaking you look for a thin gray scar gray white line if you get then you know that the wound has healed well and if your apposition is good then usually in about 30 to 45 days you can remove it even in um, adults but you need to uh, watch it on slit lamp check it out and then in children i have removed even in 10 or 15 days would you remove you no what would be in between removing time, sometimes in very young children you can remove the sutures when it is healed generally speaking you look for a thin gray scar gray white line if you get then you know that the wound has healed well and if your apposition is good then usually in about 30 to 45 days you can remove it even in um, adults but you need to uh, watch it on slit lamp check it out and um Why? why was my voice repeated i have no I idea i don't know i have no idea this was so i was very impressed the first time that um, arc <laughs> has given me so, double double speech um, <laughs> no. um and, uh, uh, if it's a very linear wound also would you uh, think of doing uh, interrupted sutures or is there any role of continuous suturing anywhere or absolutely is none only no. interrupted no. sutures and you can remove if you're not sure you can remove alternate sutures don't remove all at the same time remove alternate sutures wait and watch maybe 4 oh. 5 days later you can go in and remove the remaining and while, while we are talking on sutures i thought i might just take a question on a pk or a dal uh, graft in general which is not a traumatic suturing which might have uh, a lot of relevance <coughs> because this is topic is uh, corneal suturing so in this uh, how what would be your measure of removing a sutures yes you would leave an interval of a month and all that but uh, to what level of astigmatism would you want to remove the sutures or would you want to remove all of them in a pk or a dal kit just depends on your suturing technique so if 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 you've taken continuous or interrupted or if you've taken interrupted then you can decide according to the astigmatism you can start playing around you can um, uh, loosen or tighten sutures uh, uh, or you can if they are continuous sutures you can loosen or tighten um if they are interrupted sutures you can remove key sutures and reduce the astigmatism i normally start all this about, about in adults in about 30 days or so uh dr ashish if it is a very irregular cornea when you are talking again about a graft uh okay. what would be which suture would you think is a critical suture to remove how would you take your decision i mean i'm i'm assuming that uh, 
we are removing it because of the high stigmatism and regularity. Yes. yes. Okay. So what suture? I would base it, try and base it on the topography. Mm -hmm. But sometimes if it is, and of course the steeper one, mm -hmm. which matches with the steepest axis. Uh, but I'm very slow with this. I think with the grafts, I'm very slow. I'm very careful. I also gauge the patient's needs and requirements uh, because I usually do counsel them. That's, it's very various. Sometimes you may feel that that is the suture to remove and it suddenly the stigmatism goes on the other side. So uh, the two things, the important thing is topography and also looking at the graft host junction. The compactness of the graft host junction tells me that it has healed. And if there are any striae also matching with the right suture, then I would go for that removal. Yeah, and anybody? Oh, sorry, ma'am. Mm. Yes, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Just uh, anybody with experience of uh, using uh, viscoelastic or AC maintainer while repairing corneal tear, which helps. Dr. Maskati, I think you are using viscoelastics. I use I use a lot of visco. I use viscoelastic. It gives me comfort, but at the end, as Purendra correctly said. I'm extremely fond of air. So I will put in air at the end of any traumatic uh, corneal tear that I'm suturing. And what is your experience of using AC maintainer while suturing? I don't use AC maintainer. Yeah. Anybody from the panel are they using? Uh, not, not for suturing. Okay. Okay. Can I just add one point, ma'am? Yes. yes. Uh, so this regarding the... Uh, Raftos junction healing, what uh, Maskati sir and uh, Dr. Ashish were discussing. I just want to add one point is that nowadays we have the anterior segment OCT. So that is also a very uh, useful tool to, you know, study the uh, opposition of the graft post junction, whether, you know, it is, whether, whether it's opposed properly or it's just superficially opposed and things like that. So that could also help in, you know, uh, timing of, you know, suture removal. So you could monitor that and uh, based on that also you can uh, time a suture removal. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or shall I go on to the next speaker? Yeah, I just wanted to add again uh, the, something which uh, Ashish, because of uh, paucity of time, couldn't cover is that if the corneal tear extends up to the limbus, it is mandatory to open conjunctiva near the limbus and look for a scleral tear, an extension. So mm -hmm. if, if a corneal, if it looks all fine, but if, if the limbus is involved, you must open the conjunctiva there. And if there is a scleral tear, you need to close the limbus first and then keep following the tear. Uh, down and you can use even vicral sutures to close the sclera and then come back to the cornea and finish the corneal suturing. Yes, yes, thank a very relevant, very relevant point. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Muscati and. Uh...